and, uh, and, and I would like now to welcome you to this uh, to the last session of today, uh, which is a plenary session on, uh, roughly speaking, on, on various issues regarding uh, preferences. Uh, we got two distinguished speakers. In this last session, uh, uh, we will first have Nava Ashraf to speak about uh, uh, extrinsic and intrinsic motivation and how the economic uh, environment affects the uh, or interacts with the preferences. And then we have uh, Carla Hoff uh, speak, uh, giving an overview paper on, on, on preference and alternate. Uh, uh, I should say that I'm, I'm extremely pleased and uh, all the other organizers are also oh, very pleased that you were able to come and, and accept our invitation. So, thank you. And the first speaker is uh, Nava Ashraf, uh, who's a professor at Harvard University. And she's got a PhD also from Harvard, correct? And, uh, and, and her topic today is here. It's, uh, no margin, no mission and a field experiment on incentives for pro-social tasks. Nava, please, the floor is here. Something like uh, 45 minutes, and then we have uh, time for discussion after the both of the plenary talks. Can everyone hear me? I don't know if this is... This is, is that on? Is it on? Yeah. Yes. Great. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, the title of this talk, No Margin, No Mission, comes from a motto of social marketing. So social marketing applies market mechanisms to the delivery of health products and services, um, often in developing countries. And the idea is that, um, just like in the private sector, unless you give people a financial margin, they won't have a mission. Uh, they won't put an effort into the task. And you know, of course, as economists, we care a lot about what makes people put effort into a task, not only to be able to understand underlying behavior, but also to be able to design optimal incentives. Our standard economic models often emphasize the financial payoffs in our utility functions, but, uh, but in, <laughs> let me let everyone in. <laughs> um, so, are you saying that, that our standard economic models um, emphasize the monetary payoffs in our functions, but increasingly we've been um, incorporating kind of pro-social dimensions into the utility functions. And understanding those pro-social dimensions seem particularly important when we think about tasks like health services delivery, like education, that might have a pro-social component. Um, anything you can think about often in development work. So something that is a service orientation, something with a mission. And it's there in particular that we might think that what we've learned from economics in designing incentives, um, in particular in designing financial incentives, may provide very limited guidance. Uh, so if you think about the theory uh, around this, there's been an increasing amount of work in economics on this. So if you think about, for example, um, the paper by Bezler and Gattach, if employees are matching with organizations based on their shared interest in a mission, those types of employees may be less likely to be sensitive to financial rewards. And it may be that not only do financial rewards not be that effective, they could actually backfire if they crowd out intrinsic motivation. This is a literature that goes back 20, 30 years in psychology and has increasingly made its way into economics. But basically there's many channels through which financial rewards could crowd out intrinsic motivation by you worrying about your social image, about what people might think about you for why you're doing what you're doing, the fact that it might signal to you something different about your own motivations, or that it might signal something about the value of the task, um, that it's less than you might think it is. So, for example, this morning, um, Dean Carlin just kept asking me if I would continue to tell an off-color joke. I wasn't telling it, he told it to me, he wanted me to repeat it. And he kept thinking that the more money he offered me, the more likely I would be to tell this joke. Except actually, the more money he offered me, the dirtier I felt about the idea of telling this joke. And so, it, I, I think, you know, this is an idea that basically, from, you know, in the economics literature, we focus, when we think about crowd out in the behavioral economics literature, it's almost been entirely on the channel of social image. What are people gonna think of me? But in the psychology literature, the crowd out really comes from your reinterpretation of your own motivations. And so these are the kinds of things we're gonna explore in this paper. 
But overall, this makes us think that as we're trying to think about designing incentives for pro-social tasks, we might want to really consider alternative rewards other than financial rewards. And in particular, something that not only doesn't crowd out your intrinsic motivation, but may actually leverage it. Um, your desire to serve and have a mission, it may actually leverage that. And that, um, and that you could actually be able to tie an employee's effort, their marginal effort, to the social impact that they're having. And so as we thought about this, how to design these alternative rewards, how to evaluate them, how to benchmark them against financial rewards, we thought in a way about a model of a utility function where you have both monetary payoffs and non-monetary payoffs. And people might differ in their types, in their degree of pro-social motivation, and that's how they weigh the monetary payoffs and the non-monetary payoffs. So what you really want to do is to think about how to think about those types, measure them, and how they respond to incentives. So the questions we ask are, if we could design this type of alternative reward, what is the relative effectiveness of financial versus effective uh, alternative rewards for these types of pro-social tasks? And do different types of people, those who care more about money or those who care more about social motivation, respond differently to these types of rewards? And if we find that alternative rewards have a big impact, what are the mechanisms and how can we pin them down for what they might be working through? So that's what we do to design this field experiment to be able to answer these questions. Um, and we designed it with a public health organization in Zambia, which like many NGOs around the world, I'm sure many of you have seen, uses community-based agents to do health services delivery. And we randomize these agents to four types of contracts which represent different models of how you could motivate these community-based agents. First one is a standard volunteer contract, which often NGOs use um, in these types of work. The second has low financial incentives, which, uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you a lot more about the incentives in a minute, but the idea is basically just the smallest amount that would have a potential kind of token, high financial incentives and these alternative rewards that I'll tell you about. But as I said, we want to be able to understand people's types and how they might respond differently. So we um, measure types not only through survey measures, but through experimental measures to be able to understand people's degree of pro-social motivation. And then we follow these agents over the period of a year. Because um, most of the experiments that have been done on incentives in personnel economics, for example, often are very short term, even when they're in the field. And we might really care about at least a medium term, if not a long term. So we're able to follow them over the period of a year. So before I tell you a little bit more about the treatments, let me give you a sense of the context. So uh, this was in Zambia, which has one of the highest HIV prevalence rates in sub-Saharan Africa and in the world. And um, surprisingly, the highest rate, the one that's most fastest growing, is among married couples with concurrent partnerships. So actually being able to find these people who are at risk and convince them to use um, condoms is very difficult. And part of what um, the idea of female condoms is, 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 is that to be able to target these types of populations. Female condoms are the only, it's a new technology, it's the only way that women have to protect themselves against HIV. But like many new technologies, it's a little hard to use at the beginning. It takes a little bit of effort, it, you have to have a lot of follow-up to understand. At the beginning, it's not so easy. Um, and so you need a kind of a system where you could have a lot of follow-up, you could encourage the adoption, and you could potentially think about targeting risk. So the question is, what kind of distribution channel would allow this public health organization to actually promote this technology? Um, and so what we thought about together with the organization is hairdressers and barbers. So as, as, as those of you who've worked in Africa know, hairdressers and barbers are on every corner. This is not like what we think about in terms of salons, like sort of something fancy. They could just be a couple chairs. Um, but people spend a lot, a lot of time there. They're, they're captive, they're, they're there for a long time. The hairstylists know them, they're trusted by the community, um, and they have regular follow-up. So in some sense, this is much more ideal than a pharmacist or a nurse who may not have the time or the ability, the private information to be able to target. And so the big question that, we, that the organization faced was how do we incentivize them? Do we consider them, they're private sector kind of micro-entrepreneurs, 
how do we think about how to incentivize them for this task of promoting female condoms and preventing HIV? And so uh, we did the test. We randomly assigned them to four groups. As I mentioned, the first group was just as volunteers. The second group, so the, the condoms are sold at 500 kwacha, which is about 20 cents um, US. They're very cheap, they're at a very highly subsidized rate. And we gave the lowest margin possible for the first uh, treatment, which is basically the 10% of retail price. Now we wanted that just to be able to compare with the control group because a lot of the work on CrowdOut has has shown that you know, small amounts are actually worse than not paying at all because they sort of commodify the exchange without giving you enough financial rewards. So we wanted to make sure we had that in there. And then we basically gave the largest amount we could possibly give without encouraging gaming. And so that was 90% you know, of the retail price at 450 kwacha. And then we designed these non-financial rewards. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them, but basically we had to design the non-financial rewards so that they were as equivalent as possible to the financial rewards. Now one of the most difficult things about thinking about status rewards or social recognition rewards is that they're often lumpy. You know, status isn't something that you can easily compare to a marginal reward the way you can with financial margins. Um, so what we did is give people stars for every condom that they sold, and then this lead led up to a ceremony. Um, and in all cases, the performance is measured by restocking, not self-reported sales. So I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Okay? Maybe we can hold off on the questions until the end. I'm, I'm going to try to go through all of the details of the experimental design, um, and then I'm happy to answer questions. So this is the alternative rewards. This is the um, poster that was put up in the salons for those in the STARS treatment. It says your contribution to community health and the packs of condoms sold. So you basically put um, stars up to 216 was when you got the ceremony. Turns out that only one person was able to get the ceremony. So really what you should be thinking about is, is these stars and what they're actually doing. So there's many mechanisms that you could think could be actually at play here in terms of why this might work. The idea was to tie the marginal effort to, to make it proportional to the social impact that they were having and to make this a constant reminder of the social impact that they're having. So there's a lot of work by social psychologists and, for example, Adam Grant, that suggests that if you can keep this kind of constant reminder of the social impact, that could be very powerful. And so you have this warm glow effect of reminding yourself. It makes your contribution visible to others who are coming in. And it allows the social comparison with other promoters that are in your same treatment group. And we'll try to test through all of these um, when we get to the mechanisms part. So, this is how we did the design. So those are the treatments. We first did a census of all 2,500 salons and barbershops in Lusaka, and we geocoded them all. And then we randomly assigned 1,200 salons to four treatments. We needed to, um, we basically took all of Lusaka, here's all of Lusaka, and we created a grid, and we, we put it on top of these cells. What we wanted to do was minimize spillover. So there's a lot of buffers in the middle. Um, and we created enough buffer space that was basically the largest amount, the smallest amount through which you wouldn't get kind of a lot of spillovers. So that we could create distinct areas, distinct cells. So we ended up with about 200 grid cells with an average of 14 salons per grid cell. But that's an average. There's a lot of variation within the grid cells of the number of salons. And we're actually able to exploit that variation to look at social comparison later on. So that's basically what it looks like. Each of these colors is a, different, um, is a different treatment group. And inside is the number, but you won't be able to see that. In between are the buffers. So we stratified on a number of variables that we thought would actually interact with the treatment. So the type of salon, the presence of, the, of a bar, manager's assets, an index of altruism, the number of employees, and the number of products sold. The last two are a little bit of a measure of entrepreneurial capacity or potentially desire for profit. Um, the index of altruism is supposed to get at the sort of pro-social motivation, which we then uh, measure more directly through the dictator game. The key thing is that we announce the incentive to stylists after the training, but before they decide to join, so that we could look at the selection as well. So 
one of the most challenging things of doing incentive experiments, as you can imagine, is that there could be a lot of spillovers, and people could get very upset if they hear that some people were getting different amounts than others. So we tried to do a lot. We were very worried about this. We tried to do a lot within the design to make sure that this didn't happen. Um, we had the stylists on different treatments trained on different days. Nobody knew who was getting what. Even in the office, in our field experiment office, it was just one, two, three, four. And even anybody who was going out to the invitations, none of the staff knew who was, what treatment was happening on which day. Um, all of the female condoms at every place were sold for 500 kwacha, so that nobody, even the customers, couldn't infer whether there was a different margin or not. And we just had to do that to be able to continue the, to minimize the spillovers. What we told them in the training is, don't be surprised if you find that different people get different things. We're rolling this out slowly, and this might just happen. And they seem to accept that explanation. Um, and then we had these buffers, as I mentioned. And we find that actually there's very, very few complaints about the different margins. There's actually no one who, who came to us to complain about finding out about different margins. We monitored how much they talked to each other. And there is a lot of meeting new um, hairstylists, but that's often within the same treatment group. Um, and so we were able to sort of feel quite confident that there were very minimal spillovers between these treatment groups, both from the design and from the data. So then we invited um, these 1,200 salons to training. And the training was on HIV prevention and health information, as well as business skills. We wanted to give everyone that sense. So I'm just going to play a tiny bit of the training for you. It's, um, what we did is use the hairstylists who were in the pilot um, to talk about how to promote this, because this wasn't an easy thing to promote. And we wanted everyone to have the skills to be able to do it. And you'll see from the video that I show that um, Okay, so that just gives you a sense. I mean, one of the, the most important things, as I was mentioning, is just that you get this repeated, um, repeated exposure uh, to the hairstylist, and you can see how, how important that was. Um, we also did a significant training on business skills just so everyone had the same background. Uh, we wanted to make sure that for restocking, which is often a difficult thing, everybody kind of knew how to do that. We gave them care purses and things like that. Uh, at the training, we collected further information and we did this experimental game, which was basically a modified dictator game, where you could give, you, in addition to your show-up fee, you got um, a, an additional amount of money. We said that, you know, there's an additional amount of money that's been provided by the donor, and this is your money, but you can choose to give some of it to a local HIV charity. And it turns out that how this, there's a lot of variation in how much people give, and that variation actually explains female condom sales overall and also interacts with our treatments. So it's a nice measure of, of the pro-social motivation that individuals might feel for this particular cause. Um, then at the very end, we described the incentives that they would receive, which were different across the four groups. After they learned about the incentives, they could join the program by buying a dispenser, which was 12 female condoms for 2,000 kwacha. And they didn't receive any incentives for stocking this. They were visited every five weeks by monitors. Those monitors at that point said, how much would you like to restock? And then the following month, they were given incentives for that. That was basically to avoid all of the problems you can imagine of getting uh, self-reported sales and the incentive to, to tell people that you sold a lot more than you did and to make sure that people were getting the right amount of incentives. 
Um, and then we, we kept um, monthly for a year both restocking in institutional data from the organization as well as promoters' logbooks um, where they also logged what they were uh, selling for a year. And finally, we did customer surveys to look at customers and the end line uh, where we resurveyed all the census salons. Okay, so I, let me go to the, the, the results. So what we found is that uh, over 12 months, you know, there was almost 13,000 female condoms that were distributed. And you can see immediately, just from the means, that the STARS treatment is doing double, basically, what any of the other treatments are doing. And the outcome measure here is restocking. So we're using restocking as a proxy for sales. It's a pretty good proxy for sales. And we're using it just, again, like I said, to avoid the problems with self-reports of sales. So if you... Um, that's just the means. If you control for everything, you can look at, see, this is um, average over a year, and the mean in the volunteer group is about seven condom sales. Let me just show you first um, some of the other variables that predict sales. As I mentioned, the dictator game giving, uh, if you're giving above median in the dictator game, you, are, you, know, you sell about 3.4 more condoms, 3.3 more condoms. Um, then if you're not, if you're Roman Catholic, you sell 3.6 less condoms. Um, so it's another motivation. Um, if you sell other products in your salon, which as I mentioned is maybe an, a measure of how entrepreneurial you are in general, you will sell about five more condoms um, than otherwise. And here you have the treatment effect. So you can see that, again, the large financial reward and small financial reward are really no different from the volunteer at all. Uh, but the star rewards are significantly different. So, so agents in the star treatment are selling on average about seven more condoms than in the volunteer or in the low and high financial. So we get our basically our first result, which is that um, the financial rewards don't seem to actually induce effort any more than a volunteer contract, but the star's rewards are significantly inducing effort. And this is not driven by outliers, and this is the case also if you look at the extensive margin. So if you look at just, you know, if it equals one, if we stocks at least one pack, and this is an important feature of the data, that, you know, 64% of stylists are actually not able to even sell their first, get their first dispenser. So just to sort of get started on this is difficult. But again, here is where the stars keep motivating people. So stars, people are 12 percentage points more likely to restock at least one pack, and this is sort of significantly driven, gets sort of even more if you restock 12 or more packs, and if you restock 24 or more packs. So this is really what's, what's driving it here. And this happens, you know, with the, the Star Rewards as well. The exact same control variables that I mentioned also um, contribute to this. This effect, if you look at the monthly data, persists across the year. So the differential treatment effect is the same, you know, if you look across the year, month by month as well. So one challenge you might think is, you know, how much are sales and restocking correlated with effort? What we really are trying to measure is the stylist effort towards the thing. So we have a bunch of measures of effort, including their attention when the monitors come, et cetera. And the paper has like 10 different measures of effort all go in the same direction. I'll just show you a couple, which is the, how much they display the various posters and whether the logbook is filled. And again, here we find that the star rewards are really um, driving greater effort on part of the, the stylists themselves. So, so now we have to think, okay, what are the mechanisms behind why stars would have such a strong impact and financial rewards wouldn't? So the first thing we wanted to rule out, even as we started to see this, you know, during the, the year we started to see this, so we first thought, gosh, the first thing we wanted to rule out is, is this really about the stylist effort or is it somehow about customer demand in some way? Is it just, you know, some kind of um, advertising effect? Oh, before I tell you that, let me just say, this is just the cost effectiveness of the incentive. So, so before I talk about mechanisms, let me just quickly mention that one of the hardest things, I think, for NGOs and development organizations, and actually a lot of other organizations too, is there's a limit to how much you can uh, ramp up financial incentives. So if you look here, uh, you know, the relative cost of providing stars is so much less than um, any of the financial rewards, and of course the benefits are much greater. So that's just sort of 
to keep in mind here. So as we try to kind of get underneath what is driving this effect, the first thing we want to rule out is whether it's coming from customer demand. Um, and, and this could be because customers see the, the thermometer, for example, and they get all excited about that, and that makes them think they want to have the, the condom. Or it could be that they're actually trying to help the stylist in some way get these stars, right? So the, the first thing that gives us some reassurance that it's about effort is that we actually, on these effort measures, it seems like that's really affecting them as well. Um, as I mentioned, we did these customer surveys, and what they reveal is that most customers, so 98% of the 2,000 that are interviewed, don't even notice the thermometer. So most people notice some kind of advertisement up, but, uh, but very, very few people actually notice the thermometer. Um, but it might be that there's a small proportion of people who do notice the thermometer, and they're the ones that are really driving this effect somehow. And so what we did in the middle of, in, in basically round six of the monitoring, was to do a placebo experiment, an, an experiment within an experiment, kind of like Inception. So we distributed a placebo thermometer to a random sample of financial treatment and volunteer salons. And, and so they got this thermometer, and the stars in the thermometer represented the average sales for all the salons. And all the other salons in this round got a generic poster. So we were able to keep constant just getting some kind of promotional material, and we just sort of offered the thermometer to see what kind of advertising effect this thermometer might actually have. Um, and then we measured the subsequent sales, and it doesn't look like there was any effect um, on any measure of the placebo thermometer. So that gives us some reassurance that it's not about customer demand, it's about um, agent effort. And now we have to ask ourselves, why are these agents putting in so much effort? Why do I care so much about stars? <laughs> what could it actually be doing for me? And, and, and the first thing we want to think is like, why are the financial rewards not working for me? Are they actually doing the crowd out that I felt when Dean asked me to be paid for something or not? And here, you know, one of the, the simple ways that people often look at crowd out is by just comparing cross-sectionally, you know, financial rewards and volunteers and seeing that they're the same. That's actually not a great test, I think, of crowd out. Because it could well be that, you know, the financial rewards do the thing of, of they're increasing your motivation from the monetary payoff, but they're decreasing your motivation from the non-monetary payoff, so you get sort of an equivalent of zero. Um, but we actually find that it's not the case that high financial is not more effective than the low financial, so they'd have to be proportional for that to be the case. Um, it's unlikely that anything is functioning, if there is a crowd out effect, it can't be functioning through the social image channel, which is, as I mentioned, the channel that most of the time in behavioral economics we think about, because everyone was getting the same amount. I mean, the, the, the female condoms in all of the treatments were all at 500 kwacha. So the customer inference about how much the stylist was getting paid is the same across the treatments. Um, in the low financial, high financial, and volunteer, there was no way, for example, for the volunteers to credibly signal that they weren't getting paid for promoting these. So if there is crowd out happening, it has to be through a self-signaling channel that the stylist is thinking to themselves, I'm getting paid for this and I feel kind of worse about it and that's crowding out my intrinsic motivation. So what we try to do is, is look at the people who appear to have more intrinsic motivation and see if those people did worse under the financial rewards or not. And so this is uh, for the people who were above median giving. And you can see that, you know, if you look at the small financial reward and motivation variable equals one, that's not significantly different. For the large financial reward and motivation of variable equals one, it's actually, you know, positive. Um, and so it doesn't look like crowd out is happening in that way. If anything, it looks like the financial rewards may be starting to crowd in. And instead, if you look at the effect of STARS rewards on the people that had experienced, uh, that had given more in the dictator game, you find that, that it's actually much, much better for them. So those who are giving above median giving in the donation game are actually selling nine, fem nine more female condoms than those in the volunteer. 
And what this suggests is that a main way in which this is working is through this sort of warm glow or this reminding of yourself, this sort of leveraging of the intrinsic motivation that might be occurring. And then just to sort of, because of all the concerns that people have with the dictator game, we just want to sort of use another measure also of motivation. So we look at whether you're non-Catholic, which is another measure since we saw that Catholics are much less likely to want to do this. And, and again, here again we find that um, the STARS Awards are really leveraging those that uh, seem to have motivation as measured by, by that variable as well. So let's see what the first mechanism that we can think about is that it's basically leveraging the intrinsic motivation, the intrinsic pro-social pro motivation of an individual. And the second mechanism is that it could be facilitating social comparison. So as I mentioned, we end up getting this variation in the number of salons um, in the treatment groups. So what we're able to do is exploit this and see if you are, happen to be in a cell with a larger number of salons in that cell, do you respond differently to the incentives? And you can see that indeed in the STARS treatment, the more you have of people in your cell, the more likely you are to be selling more. You don't see this trend for any of the other treatments. So it's not driven by features of the cell itself or the cell density or population. It really is about something that's interacting with the stars. And you know, when we did qualitative interviews, for example, we talked to the barbers and they'd say, you know, as soon as I'd get my stars, I'd run to the other barber and see how many he got. So it, it was a way of making public something that made it easy to facilitate the social comparison. Uh, And, and so we just try to see, sort of, <laughs> try to figure out which one might be more important. And, um, and so what you can see here is that these are the high donation guys and these are the low donation guys. There are some overlapping confidence intervals, so I wouldn't take this, you know, I wouldn't hang my hat on this at all. But it kind of suggests that even at, at uh, low density cells, the higher motivated guys are always selling more. But both effects really seem to be at play. So there's a number of other alternative explanations that we try to um, get through in the, in the paper. We think about incentive divisibility. Um, let me see how much time I have because I want to give some time for questions. Uh, 15 minutes. Okay, great. So you can imagine that, for example, the financial incentives are paid to the owner. They can be shared with other stylists, but, but the stars can't be shared with others. And that could go either way. It could be that you're free riding because it's you know, it's something that everyone shares, or it could be that um, they're a pure public good. This doesn't seem to be the case here because we have uh, very few salons that have more than one stylus or two stylus, but it could be important in other salons. Um, the other thing we, you might be worried about is that uh, maybe they want the stars so much that they're actually targeting the easy sales. And if you think about health impact, this is something we worry about a lot which is that you would basically choose the people who were already using male condoms and convince them to use female condoms instead. And that, of course, would have no health impact. Um, and so the Sloan's program kept a logbook of sales, including their gender, their age, the multiple partners, et cetera. And the data is recorded by the stylist. So it's self-reported and, and not great data. But when we look at it, it doesn't look like there's any differential targeting of male condom users by STARS treatment. So, gives us a little bit of reassurance that that's not sort of driving this. Uh, and so in general what we find is that the agents that are randomly assigned to the STARS treatment sell twice as many condoms and they're 32% more likely to make any sale and that this persists over a one-year period of time. It looks like the mechanisms that are underlying this is that the STARS help to leverage the intrinsic motivation of the stylus and they facilitate social comparison among the agents. Uh, we're pretty confident that this is driven by, agents, by changes in agents' effort and not by customer demand. Um, and, it, and it's stable, as I mentioned. On the financial incentives, they seem the same as pure volunteer, and they don't appear to be different for high motivation types, so there's no crowd out um, across subjects. Now, these should all be taken with a grain of salt, like any field experiment. There's lots of um, limits to external validity that we should consider. So this is a comparison of very specific schemes. The financial incentives are necessarily low-powered. It's hard to know 
what is more power than not? What it really matters is like, how much time does it actually take for me to do this versus to do a haircut? Is it complimentary to me doing a haircut? Is it a substitute for my time? But in general, it's pretty small. Even in high stakes, it's a one seventh of the price of a cut. But that's often the case in when you have any kind of limit with subsidized products. So this was the case with 500 Quattro. That was the limit of, of what you could actually offer in terms of margins. One thing I didn't mention so much is that, you know, actually, 97% of the stylists uh, at the end of the training agreed to become part of the program. So as a first measure of selection, there appears to be no selection there. What that allows is that when we do the intent to treat, which are the estimates that you saw, that's more like the average treatment, um, uh, the, the ATT. But it also suggests that there's no real selection effect here. Now, there is when you look at you know, the kind of passive selection that happens as only 37% of people are actually taking part in the program actively. But this is sort of important to think about as we think about other types of community-based agents and community-based delivery, where it might be their actual full occupation, in which case there could be significant selection at the initial phase that could come from offering different types of incentive schemes. Again, we don't find any evidence of crowding out. Um, this, you know, even when we did the qualitative work very early on in designing this, it was interesting because there was really no stigma in this environment about taking money for something. So it was very different from what we might think about. Um, and so we don't think there's any reputational effects for accepting payments. And, and that would also imply that there's not really a lot of signal, self-signaling effects either. And that may be why we don't find it. Um, but this is an area that I'm really hoping to um, explore more as we go through this. We've, we've just finished the field experiment and been getting the data, and I really want to understand a little bit more about the crowding out and crowding in. And we have the, the potential, we have the opportunity to go back to these hairstylists to look at more longer term, because um, that's really often what you want to know. Once you stop the, the financial rewards, do people act differently, for example? Um, so the longer term effects. The other thing we want to look at is just from the qualitative work, it seems sort of stunning that the hairstylists themselves talk about the impact on themselves. So in terms of having to promote these female condoms, they've often started using them and changed their own health behavior. And even on the business skills, it seemed to have affected them significantly in terms of not only their um, practices with respect to the female condom sales, but also with the other products that they're selling. Um, and since they're all in these dense marketplaces, this might be business skills that are spreading throughout these dense marketplaces. In the middle of um, this field experiment, the Ministry of Health uh, found out that we were doing this, and they had been um, designing this program that basically creates a new cadre of civil servants in the health sector, because it's a, there's a huge human resource crisis in health, as in many countries. And there's a big debate about how to compensate them. So we're right now in the process of designing this national field experiment to look at compensation. So it's a wonderful time to think about feedback and discussions. So maybe I can open it up to questions now. Yes, yes. Um, thank you very much.